Hallelujah. What a morning. God is so good. Isabel said, can you smell the smoke? Ah. Can you smell the smoke, she said. We were just sitting halfway down there. God is so good. What a wonderful year we've had. For some it's been not the easiest of years. For others it's been a good year. And time of year when people have perhaps lost their loved ones come to Christmas, they're not there anymore. Yeah. And for some, there's new children that last year weren't here and some new ones this year. Just want to share a bit of scripture with you. It's a very little bit. I'm quiet really, aren't I? Trying to just feel my way through this thing. (laughs) Because God is so good. And it's the scripture really in Luke chapter 1. If you want to look at it, you're welcome to. But it talks about a particular man. His name was John, John the Baptist. You very rarely hear about John. Apart from the fact that he came and he was the forerunner for Jesus. But do we look at his past? You you know, when you consider the Bible, we just look at the Bible and we say, yeah, this is great, we've got the Old Testament, we've got the New Testament. But there was a period of 400 years, according to those that put this together, between when God spoke and when John came. And between those periods, there's this 400 years of silence. It's almost as though God was saying, I've got something really important to say to you guys. And it's like God is holding his breath. Can you imagine a God-sized breath? You know, <gasps> and says, I'll keep you all on tenterhooks to hear what I've got to say. And there was a man called Zechariah. Now, he was, a, he was a priest. And he went into the temple and he was going about his service as he was required. And the whole multitude was outside. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to him. God suddenly is, hey. God suddenly is. You know, we, we look at what we can do and we look at what has been and, and all the rest of it, but we understand that God has his suddenly is, and it's according to his plan and according to his purpose and according to his word. There was another place where the suddenly came, the word of the Lord came to John, and then later on the word of the Lord came to Jesus. There's a time in God, hey. Next year is a big time for many people in this room because of what God is doing in your life. And when Zechariah saw this angel, he was troubled and fear fell on him. Well, it might do. But the angel said to him, Be not afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And if you look in verse 18, Zechariah said, How shall I know this from an old man and my wife is well advanced in years? In other words, it was impossible. <laughs> John. John. Yeah, his name was John. Yeah. Going to, going to give birth to this child. Can you imagine how long... I wonder when John actually first prayed that prayer. Do you reckon when he looked at Elizabeth, he said, now there's a good, nice, mm, very, mm. nobody else would say that here, would they? But a very nice lady, you know, and prayed, they prayed for a child and they prayed for a child and they prayed for a child and prayed for a child. And some of you have been praying for a child and been praying for things for so many years and so many years and so many years and so many years. And I want to say that God has not forgotten you. What did God say? What did the angel say to Zechariah? Your prayers have been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son even in her old age. Amen. It doesn't matter whether you're barren or whether you're a virgin. God is the God of the impossible. Amen. We believe in a God who does the God of the impossible. And he said, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord God. What was his name going to be? John. Do you know what John means? Great, yeah. Yahweh the gracious. Do you realize after 400 years, the first thing that God had to say was, I am gracious. 
no matter what you have done, I am gracious towards you. That's what the first words that God had to say. When, Jesus, when John came forth and his father was able to say, Thou shalt call him John, he spoke the words of the angel, John it will be. I've always wondered personally why God had to have somebody come and prepare the way for Jesus. Interesting statement, isn't it? Because if Jesus is God, surely he can just come and, and suddenly everything's cool. You're all right. Okay, there we go. But no, there had to be one who came to bring the mountains down, to bring the valleys up, to straighten out the crooked road, to make every way path. And he said, that is grace. That is grace. When John came to prepare the way for Jesus, he spoke the word of grace. He said, whatever you have done in your life that you're afraid to declare before man, you can be, declare before me because I am making a way through Jesus Christ that you can be totally acceptable before me. Hallelujah. The world has to know this. You and I have to know this. He said, grace, grace, grace. And this year, for whatever has happened in your life, God says, grace. He says grace, but there's one greater who's coming than grace. He's saviour, and Phil's going to talk about him in a minute, <laughs> if you're wondering where it's all going. But <laughs> you see, there was John, who is grace, and then there is Jesus, who is saviour, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, the one who gives us the power to walk in this grace, the one who gives us the anointing to be able to share this grace. Amen. To make it real to the lives of people. What God has done in your life this year, you wonder at perhaps sometimes, but I want to say that as you come to him, it means grace. You know, somebody spoke to me this year and he said, if you could think of one thing that you might like to deal with that, that is always on your mind, it's been an issue in your life, and you were to spend three weeks just working solely on that one thing, what it, would it be if God could clear it in that length of time? And that was a big challenge to me, and I suppose I challenge you too. It may be that this year God has been bringing something up within your life that you know that needs to be dealt with. What I want to say to you is that God will treat you with the utmost grace and peace as you work through it with him. And the anointing of God will come into your life, and your life will never be the same again. That happened for me. I just share it with you, then I'll get out. <laughs> for, for me... The family that I was brought, on, brought up in was a good enough family, but my relationship, I've spoken about it before, with my dad was not all that good. And when this guy said to me, if there was one thing you would like to really get rid of in your life, this is what came up before me. Now, I'd forgiven my dad. My dad died 30 years ago. Um, I, I knew that the, the blood of Jesus had taken the poison out of the wound of, the, of my relationship with him. I knew that. I honoured him as my dad, but there was more that was necessary, apparently. And how I started was, I stirred myself up in the spirit. Sangara bama baba, and just went for it. Then, Lord, I just said, Lord, I submit myself to you. I submit myself to you, my God. Then I started to say, God, I bless my dad. God, I bless my dad. There's no place for holding on to that which could destroy you, but it won't destroy them. My dad died 30 years ago. I couldn't do a thing to him even if I wanted to. But I tell you what, it started to release me on the inside. The grace of God came on the inside. And as I started to get, get at things like there was a spirit of rejection, spirit of loneliness, all sorts of things. And I started to speak to those things in the name of Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus, be gone in the name of Jesus. And after the best part of three weeks, I have a family. I have a family. As I stand here this morning, the graciousness of God, I cannot see any of the heavy things that happen in my family anymore. I give you that testimony because God wants to do that for many of us here. He wants to release us from those pressures. When John came, he said, I want you to deal with this thing. I want you to deal with that thing. I want to deal with another thing. It's a bit like when we want to paint the house, we have to prepare the wall. Yeah, 
We have to prepare the wall. If we don't prepare the wall and we just put the paint on after a while, it's all going to fall off and it won't be any good. Hey. But when John came, he said, you've got to deal with it. <laughs> and as you deal with it, so God can come in, the Holy Ghost can come in, put a new screed of plaster on it. Amen. And Jesus will come and he'll put a new shade of glory all over that wall. Amen. Which is your heart. When John came, he was the one who brought forth the grace of God. And allow the grace of God to come upon all of those things that have gone on for you for this year. But as we come into the new year, we're going to see the power of God come in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that. That was a great reminder of the grace of God that has brought us this far on our journey. Amen. This music stand looks like it's been to a pre-Christmas party last night. Just a few words because when praying for the service and, and feeling strongly to ask Glenn to share about the need for us to celebrate the past before you can move into a happy future. You know, three things this morning. One is celebrate the past. You're allowed to have a look back on the last Sunday of the year, last Sunday when we gather, and you're allowed to look back and say, well, Lord, you brought me by your grace this far, and I'm very thankful. And I think we've done our best this morning to give thanks to God. It was a little bit higgledy-piggledy because when God moves in, things just have to shift. Things have to give way. But I believe in our heart we say, Lord, I do look back and I do thank you. You've been faithful. You've been kind to me. I've never seen the righteous forsake. I've never seen their seed begging bread. And that's good. But secondly, we are custodians of the present. It's one thing to look back. It's another thing to say, well, you know what? I'm not back there anymore. I'm here. And I have a responsibility to be a good custodian of the things of God now. And thirdly, we've got to look ahead and plan for tomorrow. I believe in the Increase of God next year, simply because it's a spiritual principle that God is the God of increase. God is the God who multiplies. God is the God who doesn't leave us the same, but he gives more, more, more. Until we say, of his fullness I've received, from grace to grace. And so, as we finish our meeting, can we not say, well, I would be a good custodian of the present. Lord, on my watch, I'll be faithful to you. I know this is done by the grace that's brought us safe this far. It's all by grace. But by the grace of God, we can actually say, I am a good custodian of the present. I am on my watch. I will fulfill my function and my role. You know, thinking of Christmas, obviously we are. I can't help but think of the nature of, of our God. You know, the nature of Jesus who formed the world, created the world, and yet humbly entered into the world in the form of a man, a baby. I think, how, how can that happen? Except it's the, it's the glorious truth of the gospel. The one who made the world, created all of the universe, stepped in in the form of a helpless child. And when we celebrate Jesus this morning, we celebrate a, a quality that you and I desperately need, which is this, humility. Even though we come from a bloodline of champions, Jesus himself is the champion. I mean, he is my hero, to use colloquial language. If I ever had a hero, people say, who's your hero, who do you follow? I mean, unquestionably, by a million miles, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just in religious sentiment, but because of the fact that God, who made all of the universe, humbled himself in the form of a child, a helpless child, and came as a sign of the nature of our God. And the God who was adored in heaven, Philippians 2 said, he'd been given the name above every other name. That even the angels of heaven worshipped him. He was used to worship. He was used to the uh, accolade given to him as the supreme God. He was uh, given preeminence in heaven. And he will have preeminence on the earth during the thousand year reign. At the moment he has preeminence in the church. The spirit of antichrist uh, fills every other vacuous area except where Jesus is Lord. Uh, But it's going to change and it's going to change very rapidly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That season of revival is already upon us. It's in the hearts of so many people. And when you can do a a, a baptism on a public beach and people will stand up and clap, I've never seen it before. 
Maybe it's happened, but I haven't seen it. And uh, it's a sign that the heavens are shifting and changing. That moment of acceleration has come upon us. And so, yeah, uh, custodian of the present, but oh boy, am I looking ahead. Am I looking to the future? Am I looking ahead through a prophetic window and saying, God, all the things you've declared and spoken of are surely going to come to pass in the next season. Hallelujah. And I believe each one of us needs to do something this morning. One is this. When we stand from our present position and we acknowledge our need for more, which we've all done this morning, God's heard our cry. And then we begin to look ahead into 2013. Do you see yourself as part of the bloodline of the champion? Do you see yourself as the one who has the same life, the same blood? Can this go down a bit? The same blood that flows through his veins is the blood that is now in us. Now the book of Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says this, life is in the blood. And the moment you and I receive the life of Christ, we we change bloodlines. Hallelujah. From the sin-soaked, stained bloodline of an enemy uh, to the bloodline of a champion. And that's why when I look ahead, knowing my own weakness, knowing the difficulty of my path to this point, acknowledging my present position and saying, God, I want the more that you've promised me. I want it for the fellowship. I want it for Jeanette. I want it for myself. Then I believe God says it's already there for you. But you have to be able to see yourself as one who is a champion in the sense of you have the same bloodline. You have the same bloodline. The thing with a champion, he sees things differently. I watch some of these boxers before they go into their next round and you listen to what comes out of their mouth. I mean, for us, of course, it's arrogance and pride, but it's also confidence and it's a, an assurance and, you know, let it, let it come. I'm ready. I'll oh, get him. Speaking as a champion. I know it's psychological build-up, but hey, that still goes a long way in the natural. So you and I who have the mind of Christ. But this is the problem, and I've seen it clearly in the last two months, more clearly than ever. I felt the Lord in my spirit show me three groups of people looking ahead for the future. And the first group of people were sincerely looking ahead. They were sincerely trying to see what is happening. What is the prophetic hour in which we live? What is the fulfillment of scripture in this season? What is the next fulfillment of scripture? You and I are on the most exciting journey ever. Do you understand that no more is God building denominations? No more is God building isolated groups. He's building armies of people. And the armies of people live in regions. And they'll connect with believers in the regions. This is going to shake and shock and it's going to frustrate the old order. But I want to say something. The old order is dead. Saul, who's typical of the old order, is dead. And the anointing is on David. That freedom to come into the presence of God. Where there is no veil in the temple. Where you can all enter into the purpose of God and find your identity. And not only that, get your destiny sorted out. And I believe that you and I know the army is on its feet. The army is moving with the gifts and the anointings of the Spirit all over the city. People say, oh, these these people are getting rebellious. No, they're just getting activated by the anointing. Hallelujah. They're moving by the Holy Ghost. Regional churches will become tactical headquarters for the kingdom. The, the, The two kingdoms are manifesting. Revival in God is also revival in the enemy's camp and the two kingdoms are about to have cataclysmic clashes. If we think we've seen anything, just keep looking ahead. We are going to see some things on a world scale. One of my eyes, and I've only got two, might surprise you, is always on Jerusalem. I'm saying, God, the city of the great king. I'm watching. And I'm mapping the hour by what's happening in the Middle East. I'm mapping the hour with the prophetic fulfilment of all that God said is about to happen. I tell you, we're about to have the ride of our lives. For everyone who says, I'm bored with Christianity, then it tells me this. You're standing at one of the windows God showed me, and it was a window that was filled with bars, as if the person looking out was actually in a prison. And I'm thinking, Lord, what is that? And the words and the thoughts flowed. This is over a period of time. So many of my people are in psychological prisons. They're bound by wrong thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, the scripture says, if you've got an ear, hear. Now, what a crazy statement. I would have assumed if you've got an ear, automatically you hear. Apparently not so. Apparently you can be so bound 
You can be so set in, in your thinking that even as the word of God comes, even when it comes like a hammer, it still doesn't get through. And the thinking barely shifts. People, when they acknowledge their position, says, I need to shift. I need to go further. But the shift is a shift of revelation. Any shift in the spirit is a shift of more truth coming into your heart. It's not a shift of, oh, I think I'll try harder. It's not a shift of, I think I'll give more dollars. It's not a shift, I'll go to church more often. It's a shift of, God, what are you saying? I hear it, I believe it, and I shift with it. That's the shift. That's what God is trying to say to the church. Hear what the Spirit says in this season and shift with it. Because when you shift with it, you're on the cutting edge of change. You have got the anointing that is able to penetrate and cut through. But the Lord said so many are looking through the bars of a prison, psychological prison. Their mind is stuck, locked, doctrinally bound, not able to think of new things, not able to receive new things. Mind wandering, mind like a spiritual sieve where thoughts come in and thoughts are lost. An hour after the meeting, oh, I don't know what that was all about, but boy, the fruitcake was wonderful. I mean, that, that says you are what you eat. So we need to say, I don't want to be in a prison. That prison door is open by Jesus and I'm getting outside. Hallelujah. If anyone's in a psychological prison, the door's open, get outside. But the way to get out is change the thinking. Change the thinking. Do not enter into 2013 saying, well, nothing changes here. Everything will change when the word comes. When God speaks, the earth shakes. We heard that and we sang it this morning. The earth shakes when God speaks. That's why things are shifting so rapidly in the world. But one of the last institutions to move is the institution called the Christian church. Because we're locked in the traditions of men that make the word of God of none effect. We read it, we don't experience it. Praise God, we're starting to experience more and more and more. So thankful, some of you heard the testimony a few weeks ago, a young man who'd been coming to the, to the well. He, he was very, very, very sick. He was barely making it to the meetings, came with his wife, came with their baby, all got saved, wonderfully saved, had a very aggressive brain tumour, was given just, you know, the, the usual type of statement, this will happen, it'll happen and so on. And he just sat and we prayed and we loved on him. He came back and had a little change, his, his little smile on his face in the weariness of, of his journey. And he came back two weeks ago with the medical evidence that that brain tumour is no longer functioning, no longer alive, there's no blood flowing into it, it's calcified, it's dead. Uh, the medical report was it's dead, it can't grow, you're free, it's finished. And I thought, Lord God, Thank you for miracles, signs and wonders because it's a sign. God is with us. God is with us. But those with psychological prisons can't receive it, can't believe it because they can't shift their thinking. Then there was a second group of people and they were looking and they were looking into the future but basically they were looking into a mirror. And the problem with a mirror is this. You see things the way they are and behind you you see the things the way they were. Well, we understand the way things were. We know we've come a long way. Thank you, Jesus, on a journey, going from glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith, enjoying the journey, keeping the good attitude, loving God, doing your best to love people, even those who don't have an anointing but have an annoying. You just sort of, sort of, well, I'm embracing all that I can. But when you look in a mirror, and the word itself says it's like a mirror, you see the facts. And it seemed to me in my spirit these people were so concerned about the facts. I can see that and 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 oh, if I look too far back I can see all those things. But even the present position, I see the facts. Well, you've got to acknowledge the facts. You've got to see the facts. You've got to see the way things are and then understand the way things should be and stand in the gap and say I'm not where I want to be. My marriage is not where I want it to be. My family are not where I want it to be. My city, my nation, my whatever. Stand in the gap. The way, the distance between the way things are, the way things should be according to the word. The worst thing is to stand in front of the prison and look at the bars. You can't see anything. It's just the problems, the problems, the problems, the problems, the restraints, the confinements, the the patterns of the past, the problems of the past are just there. The mirror is better. At least I can see the way things are. I don't see those bars, but I can't see in front of me. 
when I look in the mirror. I can just see the facts of the way things are. And I felt the Lord show me a third group of people in the body of Christ who were looking through an open prophetic window. They've shifted from the psychological position. They've shifted from their prison. They've shifted from just looking in the mirror and saying, well, this is how it is. I'm just a person who speaks the facts. This is how it is. And they just keep speaking and regurgitating the way things are. And they've shifted by the Holy Spirit. More revelation. Now they are part of the prophetic army. You see, the army that's on its feet is the apostolic prophetic people. The six mega blocks of Christianity given by uh, Christian historians the six mega blocks, this enormous mega block of Catholicism. And praise God, God is speaking to every open heart and every group of people and revealing more and more. Many, even in that group, are shifting in their thinking. Remember, the shift is the shift of revelation. Some in that group are born again, spirit filled, speaking in tongues, yet in the midst of stuff that maybe isn't really what God is saying. I'm not trying to be critical, just explaining myself. The second biggest mega block were the Orthodox group, particularly the European folk with the Orthodox churches, multiplied hundreds of millions of people in the Orthodox community. Then there was a massive group of Protestants who've got revelation by grace you're saved, and they shifted from the original understanding. More truth was restored to the body of Christ. And out of that, uh, out of that Protestant group, the evangelicals, those who are preaching Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And then out of that group, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was revealed around about the turn of the century. Multitudes heard it again. Matthew 3.11, you shall be baptised with the Holy Ghost and fire. And so the Pentecostal movement was birthed. Now they say there's between 600 and 700 million tongue-speaking Christians. I don't know where they got that statistic from. No one asked me. So, so 700 million and one. A massive mega block of people. And we say, well, that's exciting. That's... But you know what? God isn't a Pentecostal. God is a spirit of truth and he keeps moving and he keeps moving. So those who move with truth are now in a situation where God is not building more denominations. He's not building more uh, groups to separate and divide the body. Those who've got restored truth are rising up as a mighty army. And we, we can all say, looking back, well, I came from there and my journey involved there, but now I'm present position, I'm here. And you and I, I believe, need to say honestly before God, Lord, I'm here. I'm not where I was, so I'm not looking back with regret. I'm celebrating all that's happened. It's worked for my good. I'm here. I'm a custodian of this watch in the spirit. I'll take it seriously. I'll fulfill my obligations. I will be accountable. I will do it well for your glory, Jesus. But here for, for 2013, we're not staying here. We're moving forward. The prophetic window is filled with the promises of God. The horizon's filled with the promises. All the hope that's in our heart, burning day by day. God has not God said, has not God promised. Will not God do what he says he'll do? And so the third group of people through the prophetic picture, they were able to embrace the future. The ones in the prison, they couldn't do anything. They're stuck. And, and you know what? You're allowed to be stuck. If you're happy to be stuck, I'm talking to maybe people here but beyond here. If you say, you know what, Pastor Phil, I'm happy the way I am. I'm safe. I've got this, the boundaries. They're very tight and I'm, I'm not moving. Well, you're loved, you're welcome, and you're wanted. But our advice would be shift position. You don't have to. You know, some people enjoy their bondage. They enjoy their sin. Some people enjoy the consequences of bad decisions. Don't ask me how that works, but some people do. I don't want to change. And there are those who say, I see the facts, I understand where I'm at, this is what, where it is, I'm honest, I'm open, I'm transparent. Well, you can still stay there. In another year's time, you can look back in the mirror and say, well, you know, these are the facts. Most of them will not have changed one single bit. Because the only way to change is to embrace the prophetic word of God. And say, God, I'm going forward based on the promises you've made. You said it. By faith, I take the risk. I'm stepping out. I'm shifting with it, Jesus. Shift with your thinking. Then you'll shift with your believing. Then you'll shift with your behaving. As a man thinks in his heart, that's how the man is. And so I was encouraged because I thought, Lord, it's not that hard to shift with the Spirit. It's just a decision. I'm not happy with where I'm at. I'm going further. I'm going deeper. I'm going higher. I'm going for more. But only go by the word of the Lord. When God speaks, flow with it. 
Don't get pushed into it. Don't get dragged along. Just move by the Spirit. And then I believe you and I will have a wonderful 2013. Amen. I didn't say easy, but I did say wonderful. I understand Christmas time now without Lena. That's very, very sad for the family. Very, very sad. And, and we, we lovingly embrace the family. Christmas without Roy Rapp. Some of you know Moina and her family. First Christmas without their husband. Very sad. They're rejoicing in glory, but the family is still going through a grieving process. Jumbo is no longer with us. He went to glory this year. The Lord said to Jumbo, you're not coming to glory till you taste revival. Well, he's gone to glory, so that says something, doesn't it? It means that the anointing for revival must have cracked open. You see, but if you look through a prison, you won't see it, you won't feel it. You'll just say, oh, this is a lot of rot, just emotionalism, it's just people being silly. But if you hear it from God, and you shift with it, you'll experience the genuine. Hallelujah. Because thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. And there are others too that, that have gone to glory. And I don't want to go through all the names now because I could easily miss and therefore offend. And yet it's still been a fruitful year and a blessed year. Next year, we don't know what holds, what happens, but we know God holds the year for us. I want to finish by saying this. If you have Christ then you are a champion. If you have Christ, you have the bloodline of the champion burning inside your spirit. Life is in the blood and the activation of the blood of Christ is by faith. You've got to activate the life. A champion thinks differently. A champion sees things differently. He interprets things differently. A champion speaks differently. He declares exactly what he intends to see happen. He speaks those things that are not as though they are. I mean, everyone's a winner until one of them loses. I mean, that's what I see with, with the sportsmen. Everyone's a winner when they speak. Some of them unfortunately lose. The difference with us is everyone's a winner because Jesus has won the victory. But according to what we speak as to whether we receive it now or whether it's delayed for the future. So when we say Merry Christmas, we don't think of tinsel and we don't think of mistletoe and we don't think of more presents. Oh, well, we sort of think of more presents. But when we say Christmas, we say the champions come. Jesus, the champion of the world. Jesus, the king of all the kings and the lord of all the lords has come. Why don't we stand as we finish this morning? Just appreciate your attendance this morning. We're going to have a, a bit of a Christmassy morning tea, so stay with us this morning bit longer. Father, we thank you for this season, Lord. We embrace all that you're doing, God. We've looked back and we've been able to give thanks. Some of us still have to resolve a few things in our heart from the past. But Lord, we stand on the edge of a glorious future. We acknowledge our present position. We're not in the past, neither are we in the future, but we're right here now. But we are looking ahead. And we see promise after promise after promise after promise. And by faith we say, yes, Lord, we believe it and we receive it. Speak for your church is listening, Lord. 2013, a fruitful year, a fruitful year. Reach out to the one next to you. Have a blessed holiday season, safety, protection, divine health, divine life, divine revelation. And uh, why don't we say over each other, you are a champion, you are a champion, you are a champion. Hallelujah, you are a champion. King of kings, Lord of lords, lives within you, you are a champion.